You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. All right, everyone, super excited to dive into this week's episode. We are getting the opportunity to speak with Leslie Tane, a financial attorney with over 20 years of experience, author of the book, Life and Debt. And we have a couple of goals for this episode. What I really wanted to do, I think she has some amazing insight, both as a single mom who realized almost after the fact how bad the financial situation was, working through that towards a goal, dealing through the psychology of debt, maybe debt shame, something that a lot of people have kind of presented to us as something that they're struggling with. And then, you know, pursuing financial goals as a single mom, this is something that I just, I don't have capacity to speak to. And I think Leslie is going to bring a level of empathy and understanding to this conversation that we just couldn't do it on our own. So we're very grateful for this and to help me with this conversation. I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this for a while. I think Leslie will provide this amazing level of detail that you see it from both sides. She went through this personally and now she aids her clients in the exact same topic. I find that extremely fascinating. So with that, Leslie, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me today. So Leslie, I want to talk about a little bit about your story here, but as an attorney, attorneys, you know, law school can be expensive. And it seems to me that part of your story is really embedded in the fact that you had this law debt. You assumed it was being taken care of by your spouse, but found out that it just simply wasn't. Like, help place us in time. Is is this really where your money story begins, or is it before this? So I think my money story begins much before that, more like in my childhood, because I think that as a what happens to you and the impacts of your experiences in your childhood related to finances carries into your adulthood. So my father always took care of the money. There was always discussions, conversations, arguments about money, and he was the one who controlled it. And my mother never really appreciated that fact. And so when I got married, which I did very young, I married somebody who also controlled the money. He was a little older than I was. And at the time, you know, he was paying bills regularly because, again, he was older and I was still in school when I met him. So he took over and I was fine with that. And what happened was, as far as the debt piece, I mean, that certainly steps in later. But my, like I said, my experience with money and happened in childhood. And I think that happens for everybody. The reality is that you both of you have had different experiences based on how you grew up, how your parents spoke to each other, how they spoke to you about money, your socioeconomic status, what you observed even in your childhood. And that definitely is impactful on the choices that you make as an adult financially. So you're, you're newlywed, you're in this relationship and partially because of the experiences of your childhood, that was just okay. You didn't, you didn't question where the money was going. You didn't have any input into where the money was going. Is that fair? Or give us a little bit more flavor of what your relationship with your spouse at the time, what those money conversations looked like. That's a hundred percent accurate. I didn't question it. I didn't ask about it. You know, he said he was taking care of the bills. He was the income earner at the time. I was, uh, I met him when I was in college. I graduated from college, went right to law school And right after I graduated from law school, within a couple of months, I got married to him and he was already working for many years and had a system and his system was very regimented. And in fact, you know, he would say to me, whenever you buy something, you have to put the receipts in a receipt box. So I'd have to go into the office in the house and drop them in a receipt box. And I remember feeling a little strange about having to drop them in the receipt box, but he was very particular about how he managed the finances. So he would take the receipts and he would match them up to credit cards or whatever was being spent. So there were no errors, as he explained to me. And I was just fine with it. And truthfully, early on, I wasn't earning much money. So I think I felt at the time, and again, this is really different from the mentality of today, but I think I felt at the time that I was not in a position of strength because I was the one who wasn't working. I wasn't the income earner. So because it was his money and he was supporting the household or the two of us at the time, 
that I felt like I didn't have control or the ability to say anything. We really had no discussions about money, frankly. And in fact, everything was password protected. So I didn't open the mail. I didn't look through his computer. I'm not that I was inclined to, I wasn't suspicious, but it was password protected. I didn't have any of the information. And I remember one time I said to him, you know, if something happens to you, how am I going to get into the computer? I wouldn't even know where to begin. And I think that's not an uncommon position, certainly for women. And I think it's not an uncommon position for somebody who feels that they were at a disadvantage because one of the two individuals in the relationship has, has the money. And, and that's where I was. So I let him do it. He was managing the student loans and he said, I'm taking care of it. I'm deferring it. I'm putting it into forbearance. I'm doing this and that. As the relationship started to deteriorate within a couple of years, I started to become suspicious about bills being paid. You know, there was a lot of mail coming to the house on the student loan stuff. And I would be like, why is all this mail coming? That's really what started to tip me off as far as what was happening and going on. And again, as the relationship started to deteriorate and I was starting to contemplate what was going to happen in terms of the relationship, I started to really look at the finances and try to look at the finances and see what was going on. And then I started to ask questions. I picked up the phone. I called Sally Mae. I tried to figure it out. And I realized that he was missing deadlines. Paperwork wasn't being submitted. It was submitted without certain information. And I thought that was so odd because he was really... I don't want to use the word anal, but he was really particular and detail oriented when it came to paying bills and filling out forms and just very detailed individual. So I thought to myself, this is strange that he's missing these things. So then I start to think that perhaps either it was subconscious on his part, a little passive aggressive or, or it was conscious and he was deliberately doing that and causing issues. So, you know, again, it took me a while before I felt that I had the strength in the relationship to take control of it. I really wasn't earning money, so I didn't have the position. I just didn't feel like I had the position to do anything about it. Leslie, I'm curious, what would you advise someone in your position? What advice would you give to your past self who's maybe seeing some of these red flags like that password protection? I'd love to hear more about that conversation when you said like, Hey, what happens if you die? What do I do? I mean, does he say, no, I'm not giving you the password? Talk us through a red flag like that and what advice you would have given yourself. So that's such a great question. What would I say to the younger Leslie under the circumstances? You know, when you're in a situation like that and you don't have a lot of experiences to you, to me, it seemed normal. It didn't seem abnormal. And you have to remember there wasn't the same information accessibility that there is today where you can just go on your phone or you can go on a computer and you can basically search anything and find lots of information. So we're talking almost 25 years ago. So it's a long time and things have changed dramatically as far as the accessibility of information. So back then, you know, I would have said, you need to start talking about this with somebody else. You need to ask, is this normal? Is this what goes on in other relationships? I could have gone to a bookstore. So let's go old school. I could have gone to a bookstore and tried to go into the self-help section and look at different books on relationships, marriage, finances, things like that. The reality was that I didn't. I had a baby like pretty quickly, about a year and a half into my marriage. And then I, two years later, I had twins. So I had three babies you know, very, very quickly. And I was working. So by the time the twins came along, I was in-house counsel for a national debt company. I was working. I only took two weeks off from work after my twins were born. And I had a C-section and then I had preeclampsia after I delivered. So I was in the ICU and I still only took two weeks off from work because again, let's go back in the day. I was worried about losing my job. I was worried about needing the money to support my family. I needed a babysitter, and that was so expensive for three babies. So I went back to work very, very quickly. And I worked for men. And again, you you don't have the same type of office environment and the expectations. I definitely would have been eligible for family leave if that was available at the time. So there was a lot of pressure on me. I had three babies. I had this, this big job. And I had a husband who at the time wasn't very supportive or communicative about the finances. And it just goes by the wayside. So when I look back on that, and there's a lot of people in that situation, you know, when you have little kids and you're working, life is so fast. 
and so crazy. You barely have time even for yourself or your relationship. And then to sit down and want to have a conversation about money. I'm not even sure back then when I would have fit that in, but I would say you have to, I would say, Leslie, you have to, you have to find the time, whether it's 10 o'clock at night or three o'clock in the morning when you're feeding the babies, you have to find the time to understand the finances of the household, what's going on. And again, when you're dealing with somebody who's very controlling, who isn't willing to communicate with you, that creates things even more difficult. And you become not necessarily frightened, but you take on a position where you are uncomfortable asking questions. That person makes you feel uncomfortable. Do you not trust me? I have it under control. I've been doing it a lot longer than you have. You're too busy with the kids and other things. And you know, you didn't, this wasn't said to me, but you didn't go to school for this or you wouldn't understand. But those are things that are said to uh, my clients who come to me from those situations. Some of that was said to me. I have it under control. What's the problem? You don't trust me. I've been doing it a long time. So you start to, you, when you get that kind of pushback and resistance, you're in a position where you start to feel uncomfortable about approaching the situation. If that person bites your head off or gets angry or upset, you will also be in a position where you'll be uncomfortable to approach them. So again, there are solutions. One of the solutions could be, I really think we should go see a therapist. And I actually did say that to my ex-husband, my husband at the time. I did say, you know what? I don't think we communicate well. When I feel like when I speak to you, you can't hear me. So you know what he said to me? He said, you're the one with the problems. You go see a therapist. I'm not going. I don't think that mentality and those comments are unique to 20 something years ago. I think it's unique to a particular individual who's very controlling. Uh, and I think that that's a common response. And I see a lot of clients here who come in and believe it or not, I see it in um, same sex relationships. I see it sometimes the male, sometimes the female. It really isn't necessarily gender specific at this point anymore. Years and years ago, it was typically the male who was um, the one who was in control of the finances and would take that position that you don't really have a right to say anything in the relationship because you are the, the woman in the relationship. In my situation, he was just controlling about it and for whatever reason, unwilling to share it. And even when I communicated to him that there were issues, he was unwilling to have those conversations. I did go to therapy on my own. I did start to have those conversations with therapists on my own. And that was certainly the beginning of the end of the marriage because I did go on my own and I did get stronger and I did get smarter and I did start asking questions. And I started to look around and say, what is happening here? That's when I started to feel more comfortable with myself. I mean, you have to remember, I was in my 20s. I graduated from law school right after college, so I was, what, 20, 23 years old? I got married at 24. I had a baby by the time I was 26. I had three kids by the time I was 28. So you're talking about a very young mind uh, and without a lot of worldly experience. And that's not, again, that's not an uncommon scenario today where people get caught up. It's not like I was on my own for 10 years and then I got married and had children. So I was reliant early on on my ex-husband and I became uncomfortable asking questions when he would push back. So yes, you could characterize it no doubt as a type of abusive situation. And it was, uh, certainly in today's standards, but when you're in it, you don't realize that. And then the ceiling gets lower. And as the ceiling gets lower and you become less and less likely to feel comfortable communicating, if you don't get yourself some help, that ceiling will become the floor and you will, it will squish you. So for me, I needed to get out from underneath that. It was really, really confining and I was starting to earn money. So my career was really taking off it, as in-house counsel. Uh, I was making my own way there. I was starting to make really good money and all of a sudden the tables were, were flipping a little bit where my income was becoming pretty substantial and certainly equal to, if not close to surpassing his with a lot of potential. And I left my, that position. I opened my own firm and I worked very, very hard, many, 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 many long hours in building my practice. And then when I picked my head up, I looked and I said, this is not for me. And I felt like I was in a position that I could move on. Because early on, you know, I don't think that divorce or separation was something I was really thinking, you know, even when my children, even before, 
having children, I think I thought that, all right, there's some issues. Relationships have issues and we could resolve them. But he was completely unwilling to go to therapy and did not believe in it. And that was certainly a challenge. And that makes it even harder for those who are in that position, because if you have somebody, uh, a partner who is unwilling to really be a partner and somebody who's unwilling to listen to you and hear you and treat you equally, and then says to you, you are the one with the problems and the complaints, go figure it out. It's very hard to figure things out on your own when there's two people in a relationship. So the only way that you're going to end up figuring things out under those circumstances is that if you break away from the relationship. So, you know, from a financial perspective, my divorce was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. I was so free financially. I was, I did not get alimony or anything like that. In fact, he made a half joke that I should pay him alimony, which I thought was somewhat humorous but not so humorous, if you know what I mean. So I got divorced and I got full custody of my children, all three of them. They were four and six when we started the process. And by the time it completed around five and seven, because here in New York, that's not an easy process. And really the issues in the, in the divorce were kind of similar to the issues in the marriage. It was all about money. It was certainly not about the best interests of my children at all. It was really about money. And as soon as I offered him a buyout, on some of our assets uh, of a pretty substantial sum. That's when he agreed to the divorce. So it really solidified my understanding of the, of what I thought was the understanding of the relationship and when it came to money. And then there was since that time, and now I've been divorced many, 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 many years, 12 years around that timeframe. So over the course of the years, the issues have all been money-based every single one of them. And thank goodness. Thank. I am so thankful to the universe, to everybody who's ever entered my life that I have a career. I worked very hard. Yes. I sacrificed time with my children, but my goal was to create a career that would sustain me. That would take me certainly long past my children were around, but also that would allow me freedom and independence and the opportunity to support myself and my children on my own. The most important goal that I had when my children were little was finding a way to make sure I could pay for their needs. I did receive child support, but he was so difficult about everything that if I relied on him uh, for money, I, I, I would have been very, very stressed. And I was, you know, there were times when that, you know, when him playing with the money was stressful to begin with, but I would have been in a quite a compromising position with my children thinking about how I would support them. And I often thought about that over the years, you know, things like babysitting money, he was required to pay me babysitting money and that wouldn't come on time, but my babysitter still had to be paid at the end of the week. So luckily I had my own money. So one of the things that I really want to stress from what I'm saying, which is not like a dump on my ex-husband or a dump or a complaint, but what I really want to stress is financial independence. And that goes for men, women. It doesn't really matter your gender, your age, anything. Once you become financially dependent on another human being, you place yourself in a compromising position. One position is that you may not know what's going on. Two, that person could pass away. Three, that person could be disabled and not be able to earn income anymore. You know, you can also be in a position where that person's extremely controlling and that if you want to get out of that relationship, you will have a lot of difficulty getting out of that relationship because you will have no money because they control the strings. And whoever has the most money in those situations generally is somewhat the winner. So even though you might feel financially ruined by going through a divorce on both ends where you lose a lot to, you know, it's like a one step back to take two steps forward. You have to leave those type of relationships where you are, where there's no equality, where you cannot communicate with them, where they are abusive and controlling when it comes to money and telling you, you can, or you cannot do certain things you know, obviously within reason, I'm not saying that they're telling you, you can't go out and, you know, that they're saying to you, you can't go out and buy a $2,500 pocketbook. You know, I'm not saying anything unreasonable. I, I, I think I mean within reason, but you have to be aware of that as an individual and, and what happens to you as time goes on when you don't have any control over money. It's so important to be able to have some financial independence and whether that's a part-time job or you waited a few years and you're going to go back to school, you're going to go back to work after the kids get a little bit more independent. I get it. I'm not judgmental in any way about people's decisions, why they stay home, why they don't work. But what I 
No, after 20 plus years of being a financial attorney and helping people with debt of all ages, it doesn't matter what your race is, your age, or nothing. Debt is not discriminatory and money issues is not discriminatory. The truth is you have to be educated on your money issues, educated on your financial planning, educated in your relationship. And you know what I should have done and I didn't do because I was very young. I never asked these questions ahead of time, but I got smart. And when, before I got remarried, uh, not too long ago, I asked a lot of questions when I was dating men, I would ask tons and tons of questions about the finances. I wanted to know what their relationship was like with their previous spouse, who controlled the money. Did the spouse work? What were the issues in the divorce? You know, there's a lot of questions then, a lot of answers from those questions that I was able to find out about individuals that would make to help me make decisions whether that person was going to be a good partner for me. Yeah, I want to talk about when you're coming out of this marriage and you're kind of finding out that the student loans that you thought were being handled just haven't. In fact, they didn't even make the bottom of the pile. They were just discarded. Because with your work as a financial attorney, you're dealing with people that in many cases have debt, debt that has unraveled their lives, that is unraveling their lives. And, and in terms of the psychology of debt, and in particular, the shame of debt and the fear of debt, I'm just curious, both internally with your own situation, even though your income was coming up, you must have felt like to some degree things were kind of careening out of control. And then also, what do you see with the people you work with and what actionable tips can you give to people that are trying to combat that? So uh, from the psychological piece, what for me at the time when there was, there was all that debt and those issues, I just put my head in the sand. I was just like, I'm not dealing with it. And when I was asked, would I apply for credit cards? I'd be like, I'm not even going to get a credit card. I don't have any credit. It was one of like ignorance is bliss. I just didn't want to know about it. And that's very common with my clients that what happens is as soon as the debt starts to pile up, as soon as they have difficulty paying bills, there is a, a psychological switch that goes off where there is a feeling that everything is out of control. And when things are out of control, sometimes people take their hand off and they just let it continue spiraling out of control. They don't communicate it to other people. They feel embarrassed. They don't want to tell their spouse. They don't want to tell family members and they go inside and just keep it a secret and it eats away at them. And they're looking for different opportunities. Well, maybe I'll just apply for a loan online or I'll uh, refinance the house. Or if I could just want make one more sale or get a second job, you know, there's lots of desperate ways to, or ways that when you're feeling desperate, that people will act. And they're not thinking very clearly. And there is a huge psychological piece to the to the debt cycle. Uh, the, those feelings of shame are very, very real. I mean, I have men and women who cry in my office on a regular basis from, you know, feeling so overwhelmed with it, not knowing where to go and who to trust and feeling like they're keeping secrets from family or that they can't pay for things for their kids. And they have to tell the kids, sorry, you can't play soccer or I can't rent that instrument for you or, or I can't pay for college. I mean, those are all realities of what I see. It doesn't matter whether you earn 50 grand a year or $500,000 a year. I mean, I have clients who are very high income earners as well. And then they're sitting in situations that are slightly different. Like, I'm sorry, I can't get you the car that you want, or I can't pay for private school or, you know, there's, there's things at different levels. So, uh, and that shame and that embarrassment carries over and that causes people to make bad decisions when it comes to finances. So some of the tips that I would give out is, when you start to feel that way and you're starting to feel overwhelmed and you're starting to feel, you know, I don't want to talk to anybody about this. And maybe if I could just get that loan or if I could just do this, or if I can do that, or you're awake during the night, you're fighting with your spouse, your credit cards are maxed out. Any one of those pieces of the puzzle, it's time to stop, take a step back and just take a breath and say, I have a problem. And I need to figure out what the problem is so I can find the right solution. There are solutions out there and there are people you can trust. Yes, there are situations out there where you don't want to be involved in, where you can't trust those that are reaching out to you, but there are other situations. So you need to either go to a friend that's a either an attorney or an accountant or a financial professional or another family member that may have struggled with debt 
or you need to take some time on your own to do some research before you reach out and make phone calls. You know, anything that comes in the mail, the first thing that comes in the mail doesn't mean that that's the answer. Or if you saw something on TV, that's not necessarily the answer. There may be a couple of different strategies that can help your financial circumstances. And you need to talk to somebody who's going to be able to understand a broad range of those, not one, not like, I only do bankruptcy or I only do loans. You need to talk to somebody who understands the broad range of those options that would be available for you as an individual and you as a family to meet your goals. So stop and take a breath, write down all the things that are happening and where the problem lies. Once you know what the problem is, you'll be able to find a solution that fits that problem. The issue that I find in my practice is that most people don't know what the problem is because they go and they speak to so many people or they read all this information online and they've decided that one solution makes sense for them without really understanding whether it makes sense. Just because something works for one of you guys doesn't mean it works for me. Just because I owe Amex and you owe American Express doesn't mean that American Express is going to resolve it the same way and doesn't mean that the resolution process is not going to impact me differently than it impacts you. Leslie, I want to go back to a minute ago. You said when you were dating, you would bring up this topic of what did your money life look like in your prior relationships? And I think in life, communication is so crucial. But for many people, it's really difficult to broach these sensitive topics. I'd love if you could give some actionable information to the listeners who are maybe in your situation who want to bring that up. Is this first date conversation? When do you bring this up? Oh, I wait till the second date. <laughs> I right. assume that it got easier that you kind of hone this line of questioning. So I'd love to hear any kind of actionable takeaways you can give for the audience. So it definitely isn't a first date topic, but before you go out on before you go out on a first date, you generally have a conversation with somebody. So the way it used to work was like through text, you'd have a couple conversations, then you you move to the phone and you're going to have a number of conversations, then you decide you're going to meet. But there's a lot that somebody tells you and one of the things I would recommend is being a good listener. Part of being an excellent communicator is having really good listening skills. I have exceptional listening skills. I can close my eyes and listen to somebody's tone of voice and know that they either have financial problems. Sometimes I can see it like across the room on body language. I could see it when they open their wallet. I have a different skill set because this is what I do for a living. But what I would recommend on another level is really being a good listener. So why did they get divorced? I mean, that should come up kind of early. Or why did their other relationships not work? Are they working now? Or are they between jobs? You know, what do they like to do in their spare time? Do they travel a lot? Maybe they talk about their car, a car or an apartment or a house or uh, no, I, you know, things I would listen for. No, I don't own a house. I've been divorced. I pay, you know, many times that people will volunteer child support or alimony. Many, many, many times they'll volunteer information about their previous relationships. That's all information that you want to be listening for. You want to know how did the last relationship and were they at each other's throats? Was it amicable? I like amicable dissolutions to relationships. It tells me that that's somebody who's has an open mind. Are they still complaining about money? Like, I don't have any money because I got divorced or, you know, I'm still struggling. Listen, it, just because they're struggling or have issues, that doesn't mean they're a bad person and you don't want to go out with them, but you just want to be aware. It's all about what your, your level of tolerance is going to be, what you're looking for. You know, in my situation, I wasn't looking for, um, I was very specific in what I was looking for. I was looking for somebody who was past the divorce stage, not strapped, financially, who could enjoy life the way I wanted to. So once you get out on that date, that first date, truth is I can see sometimes based on what credit cards they pulled out. I knew, I knew immediately when they pulled the credit cards out, whether they had financial issues just by knowing which credit cards were in their wallet. Uh, which one Chase they Safra could... preferred for the win. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you know how many clients I have with a Chase Sapphire preferred that are in debt? <laughs> oh, oh, come on. Bummer. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, I have clients with platinum cards that have, you know, debt problems. So those are just one, but I, but there are lots of other cards that are out there, lots of products that are out there. So I can kind of see just from the card, the use of the card, the wear of the card. I mean, I know, I knew when, as soon as that wallet opened, what was happening. Also the way they handled themselves at the table, you know, were they willing to 
purchase that for me. Plenty of my single friends and myself, you know, we always had so many great stories. Were they not willing to pay for the date that you went on? So, you know, that's maybe that's not somebody that you want to go out with in the future. And why is that not the case? And again, it depends what you're looking for. And it's not a judgment. It's, it's a standard. And it's an understanding. Um, and then as you start to date that person, you definitely want to know, are they a saver? Are they a spender? Are they, you know, I dated some guy once that would buy jeans like they were going out of style. And he was not in the jean business. He was a professional and he had to wear a suit to work. But he had so he had the whole closet full of jeans. I mean, the entire closet was devoted to jeans. There must have been 150 pairs of jeans in there. And anytime he was out, he would buy all these jeans. And I and I would be like, what are you doing buying all these jeans? You never even wear them. So it's just like an interesting, you know, you see people's, I only say that as like an interesting thought, like this person just, that's where they spend their money. I mean, it didn't bother me, but maybe whatever their spending habits are do bother you. And you want to know if you have something called bird and fish issues, you know, obviously a bird can't live in the water and a fish doesn't live in the trees. So, and that comes to saving and spending too. You can't really have a successful relationship with somebody if your saving and your spending habits are so diverse. If one person is just frivolous and spends like crazy and has no savings, that is not going to make you comfortable. If you are a saver and you believe in being careful about your spending, when you see somebody else, what you would consider reckless is going to make you crazy. If you go out for dinner with somebody and they don't have a problem spending $100 on a bottle of wine and you that makes your stomach turn to spend money on, on liquid like that, then that's not that relationship is not going to work. So I use that as an example, but you, you have to be aware and you have to ask the questions. And as time goes on and you're getting comfortable with them, I mean, I was in a relationship that I ended over money. It's, there were other relationships that I wouldn't go further because of money related issues. It's not being in debt. I totally understand debt. I'm, I get it. It's what you're doing about it. And for me, it was, it's really about what the mentality was of the individual how ambitious they were, what they did with their money, what their future goals are. Do they spend their money on their kids? Are they cheap with their kids? Do they hate their ex-wife or, you know, when they refuse to pay them and they don't care if the children are living in squalor and poverty, you don't want to be married to somebody like that. I mean, that's just not a nice thought process, you know? So when you're dating somebody and really what I learned in my adult years and from my profession is learn who the other person is really well, because even though you love them and you think you're in love and you're in love with a few things about them, those things, the money issues are the number one relationship killer. And I come in here and I've had to separate people. I had a, um, actually a same sex couple who um, were absolutely at each other's throats. I had to separate them and put them into different spaces. They were so angry with each other about the money situation. I've had abused women. I, I've had, you name it. And I think the underlying issue is not having a really good understanding of that. The other side to that is how that person would respond in difficult financial times. So things are great. Let's say you're dating somebody or you're young and money, you don't care about money and you, you know it's not an issue for you and you have your money and you're independent. They have their money and they're independent and you have no no thought that you're going to combine money ever. So the question becomes, what responsibility do you have for that other person if you're living together and they lose their job and have no more money and they can't contribute to your household expenses? And then that person is not motivated to get a job. I mean, I'm, I'm making this up as you know scenarios that I've dealt with uh, over the years, but those things do happen or that person gets sick and now you have to take care of them or they pass away and you're married to them and you're now responsible for their medical debt. So, you, you know, you, it's OK to have the thought that you're going to keep everything separate and it really doesn't matter whether the other person is a spender or a saver because um, you have your own money and who cares? It does matter and it will matter and it will impact you at some point in your life. You can't live your entire adult life for, and your adult life could span a good, you know, 60 to 70 years. You can't live that whole time without a financial hiccup. It's just, it happens. And that means whether it's loss of income or tremendous expenses, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a negative that happens. It could be like in my situation, I have five children in college, three of my own and two of my stepchildren are all in college at the same time. So talk about, you know, a huge hurdle, a financial hurdle that we have to get over our together. 
Uh, and the spending, you know, who's spending what on who and when, and then the kids all point their fingers at each other because it's one big happy family. You know, those are things that are realities as you get older. And how are you going to tackle that? I actually, I'm glad that you brought up your kids. And in particular, I want to go back to your single mom. You're cleaning up several years worth of financial infidelity, effectively. You're also trying to raise these kids as someone that is pursuing a career, and it's a re- career that requires an intense level of commitment. I just want to know if you could speak to people that reflect that situation, that are living that right now, the mindset, the tactics, the strategies. How did you find balance? You know, or, or was that even possible? And you say, well, balance doesn't exist for me in the short term. Like, how do you how do you do that? So balance is not like a balance where there's like a a teeter totter and you can balance it equally or it's a scale and it becomes equal. The truth is your life under those circumstances as a single mom working and you're a career person or a single parent, I should say, and, uh, and you're a career person and you're working really hard to build your practice or your business, there is no exact balance. Some days my business suffered, some days my family did. And there was never a day that I felt like I was this amazing businesswoman and amazing mom at the same time. There were days when I thought uh, I'm the worst mom or I, or my business could be better if I could just focus on it and not have to run home in the middle of the day or deal with the things that I had to deal with. Or if I had uh, somebody else, a spouse or a parent that was helpful and helping me raise my children, because like I said earlier, I raised my children on my own with no help other than live in babysitter. So it was definitely a, a big challenge. What I did though, to try to balance it was that my home and my office were very close by. So if I needed to get to the kids' school during the day, I could go. I did not have lunch with the girls after the event at the school. I went back to my office. Uh, when I would put my children were little, I would put them to bed and then I would go back to my office to work. I would tell them, you know, mommy has to work and it's really important that mommy go to work and I'm sorry that I'm not here. And there were days and I can still remember like yesterday that, you know, I would leave and watch my babies at the front door. And that was very challenging. And even as I talk about it, it's like I feel like I could get choked up about it. But I knew that I had to do what was in their best interest. And I wasn't giving up my career because my children needed me. They weren't raised by nannies. I always resent when people would say that because I raised my children. I had somebody who helped me in my home be there when I couldn't be there, but my values were pushed through my babysitters and onto my children through me. I was there plenty of time. Uh, I wasn't there all the time. I didn't meet the bus every day with chocolate chip cookies as much as I would like to have, but I was there for all their important events and certainly on weekends. And, um, you know, I did the best I could to be there. And like I said, I I just don't feel that in that situation, you can be the best uh, in both worlds. You have to find this balance where the scale tips. Some days it's tipped in the kid's favor. Some days it's tipped in your, and your job favor or your career favor. And other days it's somewhat balanced when you can go home or you can bring the kids to work. I mean, there were many days I brought my kids to my office. Uh, and there were days that my kids said things to me that made me feel like I wasn't doing the best job for them. You know, how come you can't be the PTA mom? And I would tell them, you know, you have to be chosen to be the class mom or be in that. And I, and I wasn't chosen. I could not commit to being, uh, and some people can in their career and mine, I just couldn't, you know, I'm an attorney and my time during the day is, you know, I very much run over with clients and there would be no way for me to make the commitment to be in a place on a regular basis like that. You know, when I look back on it, do I feel like I missed stuff? You know, I would have liked to, but I had three kids. So that meant that I would have had to do that for all three kids. You know, I can't choose one kid over the other for sure. And the most challenging part for me was that I had twins in the same year and one was a boy and one was a girl. So they were both playing soccer. And I remember one weekend I drove to Penn, I drove them both to Pennsylvania and they were, their games were 90 minutes apart in two different fields all across the state of Pennsylvania. And I happened to be sick. And I went there and I remember getting sick in the car and then being at the field and having to lay down in the car, like, and then drive 90 minutes to get the kids and then be back at work on Monday. And so, you know, it was crazy. (laughs) It was crazy. And I, and it was a very challenging time. You know, I really wanted my kids. They were uh, very wanted in my life. And um, I was very happy to have full custody of them. I didn't care that I didn't have any time off. I felt like, the kids would grow up very quickly and that one day they wouldn't be there. So it didn't matter. 
that I had them all the time and I never had a break. And that's okay because I was, I felt like I could manage it. And my kids sometimes would say things like, I would always talk about money and budgeting and saving and things like that as, and they would learn a little bit about what I did. And they would say, um, things like, you know, mommy, I'm never going to work in an office like you do <laughs> or, you know, mommy, I really wish you don't talk about budgeting all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I, right. Or I really wish you didn't do what you did. And it would make things so much easier because other people's mommies don't talk about those things. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, that's so, interesting because that's actually what I wanted to ask about next, which is your kids, as you said, they're college age. They're in their late teens, early 20s. Yeah. And you've passed along significant advice to them on how to be in this position of financial strength, how to avoid debt. What are the biggest lessons that you've passed along to them? Uh, the financial independence piece. I mean, I have two daughters and a son, and I feel very strongly about them being financially independent. So as teenagers, there were a lot of things that I did to show them about money. One, and nothing was an automatic in my house. I didn't believe in allowance. I still don't believe in allowance. I'm not just going to pay you money every single week for things that you should be doing anyway. So if they wanted things or needed things, we would have a discussion about that. And then I would give them the money based on, you know, whether I felt that it was something they needed, wanted or a compromise. So I'm not an allowance fan. I also made them work at least by the time they became seniors in high school that I said, you're old enough to work. You're old, certainly old enough to hold down a job and you're going to need money for college and spending money. And this is what you're going to need when you go to college. So you're going to need to you know, have your own money. You know, there were rewards based on grades and things like that. But I also instilled that financial independence piece that how important it is to have a career. And it's so funny because my daughter's telling me about her. She has a, like a, somebody she knows at her college. And she said to me that her boyfriend is going to go into a, um, he's a professional athlete and she got into dental school. And she said to me that her friend is thinking that if he's recruited, that she will give up the dental school thing. And I said to her, she shouldn't give that up no matter what she said. I know. Right. So I was kind of happy, right, with my daughter saying that because, you know, even though your significant other is going to be very wealthy and successful, that doesn't mean that you should be giving up what your dream is and what you've worked hard for. And there can be a balance of the two things. And for my own daughters, my older daughter is a civil engineering student. She is very independent she and her boyfriend budget like nobody's tomorrow. They go on these vacations and they put a spreadsheet together of what they're going to spend, where they're going to spend it. It must and make research you so money. proud. Oh my God. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I would choke I'm up like, just on that alone. <laughs> I'm like shocked. I'm like, oh my God, it wore off. <laughs> they were actually listening because, you know, as parents, you, you really don't think they were listening to you since they act completely opposite sometimes. And when they do that, I just sit there and oh, I don't I don't even say anything like, wow, I'm really proud of you for budgeting so well. I'm just like, that's so great. I know. Uh, Let me ask you then, a follow up question about yeah. um, the professional athlete in particular uh, and not this case study, but just my child is going to become a world class athlete. And I'm convinced of this at the age of three. You're a single parent with limited resources and limited time and your kids are pursuing sports and maybe they're you know showing some level of proficiency at it, but you don't have the time or the money to one, ensure your own financial goals are being taken care of. And two, get them into the private level, whatever, 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 pick your own iteration of this possible, like as a parent with, and, and not just as a single parent, but just parents, kids, like what's your mindset talking to your clients reflected from your own journey on how to find that, that path. Yes. Maybe there's a chance that your kid becomes a world-class athlete, but it, it is a chance. And there's another side to this. Yeah. The other side is that it's unlikely that that's going to happen. So from a client perspective, I have had parents who come to me. One was, uh, had put their kid through lots and lots of tennis programs and, and, the, and went pro on the pro circuit a little bit, but, uh, never really made it where there was substantial money. And the parents were in so much debt from that. And I have had clients whose kids are play hockey and the other thing. Now, as far as the parenting thing, my son, both my twins, but my son in particular was a superb athlete. At three years old, like you said, he was a, I mean, he's now 19, but he was a superb athlete. My stepson was a superb 
athlete with a scholarship until he blew his knee out. Uh, my son played multiple sports. And at some point, because of the commitment in sports, uh, especially in travel team sports, he had to decide which sport he was going to pursue. Uh, he ended up pursuing soccer. That was his passion. He gave up baseball, but they are very expensive. And we certainly had, um, you know, there's lots of training involved in that. It's not the equipment that's expensive, although as he got older, he convinced me that he needed like some sort of cleats every season. So it does get expensive. So there's equipment that you need on a regular basis. The fees alone to play travel ball is very expensive. Getting to and from those places is expensive. You know, every year when they would change the name of the team, we had to get new uniforms. That was expensive. So there were lots of things. And my son played for a team with lots of kids on it who were from a very different social socioeconomic background who absolutely did not have the money. In many cases, they needed sponsors to help them pay for their soccer, their time soccer. But with my son in particular, and this happens with a lot of people, I did spend the time helping him with lots of private training, but he ended up even though he he probably would have gotten a scholarship, he ended up with an injury and he had a torn labral tendon in his hip. In his 11th grade, which is that pivotal year for scholarships, he ended up needing sur major surgery and he was out for six months. And he really, even though his hip recovered, he never recovered enough to have played school ball, which was unfortunate because he was an absolute standout. And my stepson, similar circumstance, when he blew out his knee, they pulled the scholarship. So all the money, and I was just joking about this with my husband, about the money that was spent on the kids. One time when my son was going into high school, the athletic director spoke at the pre-meeting to all the parents there. And he said, you are better off spending every single penny you're going to pay for private batting lessons and all the other things you're going to pay for. You're better off paying for tutors for your kids because they're more likely going to need the academic help than they are the athletic help. Because even if they could make it to college uh, healthy uh, and they don't need surgeries, I mean, my daughter had two broken arms, a concussion, and ended up with knee surgery as well. So an injury is likely in, in high school sports, and that can be a career-ending injury. So the truth is that if you have limited funds, you need to make a decision on what is going to be the most impactful. And sometimes you have to say no. And sometimes you have to say, because the odds are truthfully really against that, I don't have the funds to invest. And you may have multiple children. So in my case, I had three children. So I couldn't say to one child, here's all the money for you. And then my other two children didn't get to participate in whatever it is that they wanted to do. So, and also it takes time away from your job to take your kids to these things that happen during the week. So there's a, there's also a, uh, a piece of that that you need to be aware of if you're building a business and you're doing certain things that the commitment to your children's sports, you not only have to have the money for it, but you have to understand there will be an impact on your ability to stay focused at work and dealing with it when these kids have to be taken, you know, 90 minutes away to certain sports teams and you have to leave your office at four o'clock in the afternoon. And that's a challenge for a single parent, for sure. And certainly the financial piece of it. Again, I've had clients with kids that play hockey, that play soccer, and I've had these conversations with them. And, and same thing goes for private school when they put their kid in kindergarten in private school. And I say, you are not in a situation to be able to afford this. That doesn't mean that you're not going to continue to do it, but that just means that you're not going to have the funds to do other things like pay your cable bill or pay your other bills. So if you're willing to make that commitment and the sacrifice to spend the money, you have to understand that as these kids get older in the sports, the cost to stay competitive is tremendous. And even if they get a scholarship to go to college, and I know plenty of kids who've gotten scholarships to go to play in ball, if it's not what they really want to be committed to, like my daughter also, who was an exceptional soccer player, probably could have gotten a uh, scholarship. She was very turned off by the division one commitment. She wanted the college life. She did not want to play division one sports. And without playing division one sports, many times you're just not going to get the money to really go to college. And you can't, I mean, I guess there are parents who can force their kids, but I wasn't one of those parents who was going to force my kid to play a sport because I spent all that money and time committing to that career. And all of a sudden they decided that I don't want to be committed to division one sports because that's all you do in college is play sports if you're in division one. So 
like I said, it's super competitive. And the point is what's going to happen after that college career? Is that sport going to then carry them on to professional sports where they're going to earn a living from it? If that's going to be the case, that's, that's a different story, but there's all kinds of stories. I mean, think about the athletes. Uh, many of them weren't even discovered the baseball, especially many of them come from very poor countries where they didn't even have their own baseball gloves and they were playing in the street. Many of them, these the, the skill can be developed later. And if you see that that skill exists and it's a natural talent, your kid is going to be discovered. You don't have to start them at three years old with private soccer and basketball lessons to get them into college sports. If they have the skill, it will develop. And I'm saying this not only as a parent of children who are athletes, but that is the reality. And you can spend all that money in high school and middle school and elementary school on their sports, but you should be putting that money away in a 529 plan or some sort of other plan so that by the time they get to college, you can actually afford to pay for it. So Leslie, you're a financial services attorney. And for our audience, you know, people that are hearing this that realize they're just in over their heads, like who contacts you? What's the context for this? Why does someone reach out to a firm like yours? You know, when is it time to make a phone call? Most people tell me that they should have reached out to me nine months earlier. For some reason, that seems to be the time frame. What happens early on is that you're looking into all these other options like loans, refinancing, landing that big job, whatever it is. Eventually, you get to a point where you realize that you're running out of money. Maybe you depleted your 401k or you refinance. Then you start to do a little more research and you realize that you need a more specialized process to help you. And that's when people reach out. They come to me either lots of referrals through their accountants, other attorneys. They also very much find me on the internet or they hear me on a podcast or they see me written up in a lot of different publications because I do speak on the topic a lot. And they say, you know what? Obviously, it's uh, it's my area of practice. I know debt and I know finances like the back of my hand. And I also know if I can help somebody or not. So the opportunity to talk to me is a very open one. You know, I don't charge to have the phone conversation with me and, and let them find out what's going on to see if I can help. So very often people come to me a, a lot of different ways, but it's usually at the point where they feel like there's no other options. And if I could give any advice, I would say you're better off coming to me kind of on the earlier side, even though mentally you're not really ready for me. And that's where we go back to that psychological piece. Early on, when you're starting to feel the pinch of the finances, psychologically, people are not ready for me because they say, first of all, I'm an attorney. So that immediately is a turnoff. I don't need a lawyer. I don't need an attorney. I don't want to pay those kind of prices. I don't have that big a problem. I'll find a loan. And as you start to research this online, what pops up first in all your searches is going to be loans, loans, refinancing. Even when you start to check your credit, all the advertisements are based on different types of funding options. It's only when you get turned down for those or you got the loan and that didn't resolve the problem. And now you have the loan and now you're back with credit card debt again, that you realize that that wasn't the best solution and you should have come to me. But early on when somebody comes to me and they're really not mentally ready for me yet or emotionally ready, it's a fact finding and that's okay. And very often that person will end up becoming a client six to nine months later when they've gone through this, what I would call a typical process of trying to get yourself out of the mess that you're in. If I could ask one point of distinction, someone that's listening to this, because you're an attorney, the difference between the services that you can offer and like a financial coach, someone that helps someone put together a budget, where's the line of distinction there? Okay. So there is a huge one and it's such a great question. I'm so happy you brought that up. A financial coach should help you when you're basic budgeting, some goal setting, uh, things like that. A financial coach is not in a position to help you resolve debt. I can tell you that they likely do not have the experience dealing with creditors, even if the reason why they became a financial coach is because they resolve their own debt. Just because you resolve one or two situations doesn't mean that you really can help other people. You can work with a coach for goal oriented scenarios, you know, how to budget, how to spend less, how to manage your money a little bit better, things like that. When you're past that and you have a financial problem where you have a lot of debt, it's time to see me because that financial debt is impacting not only your credit score, but there are legal implications. There are accounting implications. There's IRS implications. There are 
uh, lots of pieces of the puzzle that you do not want to be giving to people who are not doing this on a regular basis. I love the idea of financial coaches. I think they're fantastic. And I wish all of my clients as they're exiting this process would then go on to a financial coach who can guide them along the way and keep them on track for their goals. I think that's amazing. But if you're in a situation where you have a lot of debt, the debt isn't going down, your income is staying the same and you're struggling and you're not sure what you want to do. That's the litmus test to be coming to somebody like me. I know your offices are located in New York. Do you accept clients only in New York or are you licensed in other states? I have offices in New York, Manhattan, Westchester, Long Island, but also in South Florida. So I can work with most people throughout the country. Uh, there are a few states that because of their and people should know this, there are laws in each state related to debt help and debt management. Uh, and there are states that are prohibitive. New York is a restrictive state where you have to be licensed by the Department of Finance or an attorney who only practices in this area. And that happened a number of years ago when there were all these debt settlement and debt consolidation companies that were taking advantage of consumers. And uh, many of the states changed their laws related to that. In New York, obviously, I'm an attorney and licensed to practice law here. I am not licensed to practice practice law in another state. But as far as a debt related matter, student loans, I can do anywhere. And um, as far as helping people with debt, I do have clients that live in multiple different states. All right, Leslie, so someone listening to this, they want to find out more, they want to connect with you, your content. What is the best way for someone to connect with you? So lots of ways to connect with me, certainly online. You can visit our website at www.tainlaw.com, T-A-Y-N-E-L-A-W. You can also certainly find me personally on Twitter at Leslie H. Tain, E-S-Q, and on LinkedIn, the Tain Law Group. You can find on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at Tain Law Group. Additionally, you can, of course, call in. And I would encourage you to um, check me out on Instagram. We always have lots of puppies because I raise dogs for the Guide Dog Foundation and America's Vet Dog. So we have tons of cute, adorable puppies in the office all the time. Awesome. Leslie, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. This has been amazing. Hey, thanks guys so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right, to our audience, if you got value from today's episode and if you've been getting value from the episodes up to this point, just take one second and press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. It just lets the providers know you're getting value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. If you want to support us in what we're doing here at Choose FI, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. To do that, just go to chooseify.com slash iTunes. Two, use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to chooseify.com slash cards and get started today. Three, if you're working on the milestones of FI, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free and just go to chooseify.com slash PC. P is in Paul, C is in Cat. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 100. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.